drama bin drama arab drama ole drama side drama yote pamoja ay 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 ya folks i have a real treat for you today this week we mark 39 years since a very curious and game changing event unfolded in our country the 1982 coup attempt and until now there's been very little information in the public domain as to what really happened on my show today which is the culmination of gathering information for years yeah because people have always been bothering me asking me to do a video on the 1982 coup now finally i have something that will just blow your mind an analysis that is deeper than any other that has ever been done on this topic and very very revealing and packed with information moto kuliko pasi ya maka oh yes and that's no exaggeration you will even hear on this show the voice of ekolomani bullfighter boni halwale involved in a plot to overthrow the government of kenya oh yes <laughs> and above all you will come out of my show today with a lot more clarity on what may have happened what may have really happened on august 1st 1982 39 years ago but still impacts our politics and our country today even as i speak that is why it's so important karibu sana and enjoy Thirty-nine years ago this week something happened in Kenya that changed the trajectory of the nation forever and it all started with the events of the early hours of August 1st 1982 a Sunday a day that is etched very firmly on the minds of those Kenyans who are old enough then for our purposes today It is important that we start with a quick recap of the events of that fateful day. I was at home for the school holidays. I was in form 5 then. And I don't know if it's the same these days, but in those days when you're home for the holidays, you sleep. The earliest to wake up is 11 or even midday. And so I was woken up, yeah, sometime before 9 a.m by the persistent ringing of the phone a landline and i wondered who it could be so early on sunday morning it was my dad yeah he usually traveled to a rural home every weekend on friday and returned on sunday evening he never called he had never called before but here he was on the other end of the line acting strange and in those days we didn't even have a good relationship So he asked if we were okay and he told me to stay very close to the phone the landline that was when i knew there was something very wrong of course he didn't share any information i woke up my siblings we gathered around the radio and it was just playing music and then suddenly the announcement came through the government had been overthrown by the military and it was announced that all policemen were now civilians until further notice and then we started hearing the gunshots at that time we lived in government houses situated somewhere in kilelesho not very far from the cbd for those who know nairobi not very far from the nairobi university also i now fully understood why my dad had called that that strange call from him fear of the unknown the unprecedented to cover then the very familiar voice of leonard mambo botella yeah came on on radio announcing that loyal forces had retaken the voice of kenya station broadcasting station in those days these days called kbc at least that explained the gunshots were hearing 
that could not stop and were very worried. That same Sunday evening, the president, President Moy, appeared on television looking very shaken. I remember I could see tears in his eyes. I'm not kidding. And he was flanked by the then police commissioner, Ben Gedi. And he started by thanking the forces loyal to him and the government. Yeah, and appealed for calm amongst the people. Years later, I was to learn of my dad's harrowing experience trying to get back into Nairobi from Machakos several times unsuccessfully. At one point, he was ordered out of his vehicle and told to lie down on the tarmac. And a soldier cocked the gun. And as he was saying his last prayers, a voice came from somewhere behind and said, No, I know the man. He's a senior police officer. And my dad aborted his attempts trying to get back to us in Nairobi. And was only successful the next day, Monday, August 2nd, 1982. When the police in Kenya had started to get some semblance of authority back from the military. It was serious. It was a terrible week. Many Kenyans lost their lives for nothing. Innocent Kenyans. The official figure was 240. Yeah, but anybody who was around then knew that that was only a fraction of what it really was. And naturally, after this harrowing episode in Kenyan history, one would have expected to get a full explanation of what really happened. Who was really behind this coup or coup attempt? Instead, we were fed with a story about a senior private from the Kenya Air Force, Hezekiah Ochuka, yeah, engineering, a coup, such a junior officer. It didn't make sense. Maybe in other countries it worked, yeah, and indeed it has worked. But in Kenya, with a strict hierarchy in the military and the police, that was an impossible thing to happen. And so let's go in very deep and try and figure out exactly what happened during that terrible week for the country called Kenya. And let us start by listening in to the actual broadcast made on that day. Oh, yes. The very first broadcasts to announce the coup. Yeah. And look out for the voices of Senior Private Hezekiah Ochuka, very hesitant, has problems with simple English words. And then also look out for the voice of Sergeant Pancras Oteo Akumo. Strangely enough, Ochuka was taking orders from Akumo, and yet you are told Ochuka was in charge. One of the very many strange things about this 1982 coup, and his voice is more authoritative, yeah, you'll be able to recognize that authority. He is more confident and comfortable with the English language. you recognize that. And then, also look out for the voice, wait for this one, of a politician who is still very active today, but in those days was a university student. The bullfighter of Ikolomani constituency. <laughs> Just listen in to this most fascinating audio. This is the voice of Kenya Nairobi. Time now is 12 minutes past 6. You are hereby informed that everybody is requested to stay at home. There should be no movement in town. The government has now been taken over by the military until further notice. There should be no movement of persons or vehicles from one place to another. The police should now assume their role of civilian until further notice. This is the voice of Kenya Nairobi. The time now is 14 minutes past 6. You are hereby informed that a curfew has every, has every body should be 
what? Declared. Everybody should. What, you, what is this? Stay. Everybody should stay at home. There should be no movement in town. The government has has now been taken over by the military until further notice. There should be no movement of, of persons or vehicles from one place to another. The police should now assume the role of civilian until further notice. A warning. The government has been taken by a very, very, very powerful group supported by the people. Wana inti wenyewe na wana jesi wote. Kwa hivyo, wherever you are, cooperate or you blame yourself. Thank you. Voice of Kenya. My dear countrymen, here is an announcement. It is with the greatest pleasure that I announce to you today the overthrow of the corrupt regime of Daniel Toroy teacher Moy by the patriotic forces of our country. As I speak to you now, our country is fully and firmly under the control of our armed forces. Every care has been taken to make the revolution as bloodless as possible. Fellow Kenyans, over the past few years, this country has been shedding from an open to a closed dictatorial and inhuman society. The fundamental principles for which many of our people sacrificed their lives during the heroic struggle for independence have been compromised in the interest of a few greedy and responsible bandits. Over the past six months, we have witnessed with the disgust the imposition of a de, a de jure one-party system without the people's consent, arbitrary arrest and the detention of innocent citizens, censorship of the press, intimidation of individuals, and general violation of fundamental human rights. This ruthless oppression and repression is reminiscent of the past colonial days which Kenyans thought were buried at independence. A gang, a gang of local tyrants has emerged whose only function is to terrorize and intimidate with senseless warnings, rampant, co rampant corruption, tribalism, nepotism has made life almost intolerable in our society. The economy of this country is in shambles due to corruption and mismanagement. The cost of living in Kenya today is among the highest in the world. When an inch can no longer afford to meet the basic requirements of life due to exorbitant prices of the basic necessities such as food, housing, housing rent, transport. Above that, Kenyans are among the highest taxed people in the world today. One inch. Under these circumstances, our armed forces have headed the people's call to liberate our country once again from the forces of, of oppression and exploitation in order to restore liberty, dignity, and social justice to the people. In doing this, we have proved to the rest of the world that no individual or group of people can permanently subjugate or take away the freedom which our fathers and grandfathers so gallantly fought to bring to this country. Like the, like the British imperialists, the same fate 
will befall whoever attempts to tamper with our freedom. Countrymen, it is not the intention of the military to stay in power indefinitely. As soon as the situation allows, elections will be held and one inchi will be given an opportunity to choose their leaders. Our immaculate task is to stamp out corruption and set out a conscious program of development for Kenya. We will continue with the original policies which this country set at independence and which have been eroded over the years, thus giving rise to the current sad state of affairs. A number of administrative and security measures will be announced in due course. This revolution is entirely an internal affair and our friends have nothing to fear. We will strengthen relations with our neighboring countries and we will continue to champion the policy of non-alignment and non-interference in the internal affairs of other countries. As for now, the constitution has been suspended and the National Liberation Council has been set up to preside over the affairs of the government and state. All the detainees and political prisoners are released forthwith with immediate effect. Long live Kenya. Long live the People's Redemption Council. Thank you very much. This is a statement on behalf of all the students of Kenya. On behalf of the students and the people of Kenya, we, the University of Nairobi students, register our wholehearted and unconditional support for the August 1st revolution organized by the Kenya People's Redemption Council. We humbly request our new popular government to accord us the freedom we have always cried for. Thank you. In those days of only one radio station and one television station, the voice of Kenya, if you wanted to make an important announcement for all Kenyans, the person you'd look for is a man called Leonard Mambo Mbotella, still alive today. If you heard the voice of Mbotella, it was confirmed, it was true, even if the very sky above us was falling. If Leonard said it, that was it, it was true. Verified information. And so it's not surprising that on the early hours of Sunday, 1st August 1982, Senior Private Hezekiah Ochuka and Sergeant Pancreas Akumu, the main people who were organizing operations on that day of the coup, went to the broadcaster's house, Leonard Mabon Potella's house, somewhere in Gara, picked him up and took him to the VOK to announce to Kenyans that the government had been taken over by the military. But shortly after he finished making this announcement, the VOK was under attack from troops loyal to the government and President Moy. And then the same Mbotella came back when those troops, led by a man called Major General Mahmoud Mohammed, took over the VOK from the rebels, Air Force officers, and made the announcement that the government of Daniel Toretti Charap Moy was still very much in power, yeah, and that what Kenyans had witnessed was a minor fracas caused by some drunk Kenya Air Force officers, nothing for Kenyans to be worried about. Because this attempted coup had been crushed and Moy was still in power. In that week following August 1st, Kenyans learned that all Air Force officers were in hiding yeah, because they were being looked for 
by the military, the loyal troops, and to stay safe, many of them had changed their uniform for civilian clothing to hide amongst ordinary Kenyans. We also learned that Hezekiah Ochuka, the man who had been president of the Republic of Kenya for about 30 minutes, <laughs> and Sergeant Pancreas Akumu had fled to Tanzania, where they had been granted political asylum. Now let us go even deeper. Now it is clear that even before the coup, the local intelligence community were aware that there were some army officers, actually Air Force officers, who were busy planning to overthrow the government. Yeah. Now, this is an important clue to get to the bottom of what really happened in 1982, August 1st. Because for anybody who knows how our intelligence community worked then, they will know that the way they operated was to arrest and then ask the questions later. But strangely enough, in this case, they did not make a single move. Why? There is even an article, which is still online, about how the then head of the intelligence, a man called James Kanyoto, informed Moy that there was a coup being planned against his government. Now, that's a very strange story. You know, for anybody who understands how the intelligence community operates in Kenya. Because you don't inform the president that people are planning. You arrest, you interrogate, and then you inform the president that there are people who are planning, who have been arrested, and you're getting the full information from them currently. That's how it works. But then we must remember that in those days, Kenyans were not allowed to think. Thinking was treason. <laughs> oh yes, you are not allowed to think and to use your brains and try to figure out things. No way. So it was very easy for people to swallow such stories, hook, line and sinker, and accept them as normal. Accept it as something that makes sense <laughs> when it doesn't. Now, there's a Kenyan intelligence officer from the time, he was operating around that time, who has written some memoirs. Yeah. And he refers to an incident that happened on July 30th, 1982, just days before the attempted coup. To be more precise, two days before the attempted coup, where together with other intelligence officers, he visited the Laikipia military base near Nanyuki. That intelligence officer's name is Joseph Kibati. Now, officially we are told that the two military bases that were heavily involved in the attempted coup were the Moi Air Base, Nairobi, and the Laikipia Air Base in Nanyuki. So when Bwana Kibati went there, he already knew, he assumed, that his seniors had already communicated with the senior military officials and that they would get full cooperation when they arrived at the base. Now, for those who don't know, even if you're a very senior police officer, you cannot walk into a military base and ask to arrest soldiers. It doesn't work like that. The way it works is that the information is communicated to the senior military officers and they take action, deal with the situation. And that is why this story in Kibati's biography is very strange. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Anyway, he says that when he arrived at the base, met the officer in charge, Lieutenant Colonel Peter Kagure. Colonel Kagure told Kibati that he was not aware of any rebel officers inside his station, inside his military barracks. But he asked Bwana Kibati to come back later, yeah, as he consulted with the seniors. When Kibati came back later, he was told what he should have known all along. The colonel told him something to the effect that these are our boys, 
we shall deal with it internally. Now let us look at something else very strange about the 1982 coup attempt. According to impeccable sources, the late Jaramogi Oginga Odinga was approached by somebody before the 1982 coup attempt and was asked to be part of the plot to overthrow the Kenyan government. He quite rightly sensed it was a trap and he declined. But others like his son Raila Odinga readily accepted. So we know that there were some civilians involved, yeah, which is very strange for a military coup anywhere in the world. For the very simple reason that when you involve civilians, it becomes very easy for information to leak out, yeah, for you to be caught up with before you execute your mission. And that is why usually civilians are incorporated after the fact, not before. And we even know where these civilians were meeting with their military accomplices in Nairobi. It was a house along Gong Road, somewhere near Adam's Arcade, for those who know Nairobi. And I'm reliably informed that our intelligence community then also knew about this house and its precise location. But again, no action was taken. Why? Something else that people have never talked about. Anywhere in the world, it is impossible for a junior officer, even a senior officer, of another military base to casually walk into another military base that is not theirs and start talking to the officers there. It doesn't work like that. And yet we are told that Bonochuka walked into several other military bases to recruit people into his plot, into his coup plot. In fact, in court documents, in the trial of senior private Hezekiah Ochuka, we are told that Ochuka even walked into the very sensitive, highly sensitive, 81st Tank Battalion in Lanet. Yeah, and talked to people there, recruited some officers, very junior officers, whose instructions were to take over Nakuru immediately. The quiz announced, take over Nakuru town. Now, for those who don't know, before those tanks move anywhere, you need senior officers, very senior officers, to do a lot of things. Yeah, not just give orders, to also do other physical things for those tanks to come out. And so we can comfortably write off this particular part of the evidence as a fairy tale from Wonderland. <laughs> now, taking all these many clues and putting them together, there is only one conclusion we can make, and one conclusion alone. The 1982 coup was designed not to work. It was designed to fail. The evidence clearly tells us and shows us that whoever was the mastermind behind that coup just wanted to shtua. Yeah. That's what the evidence tells us. Some of the following. The only major strategic installation that the coup plotters took was the VOK, the Voice of Kenya. These days, the Kenya Broadcasting Corporation. In those days, there was no fence. Yeah? There was no serious fence around what is now the KBC. It was very easy just to walk in. So you can imagine the situation whereby the only strategic place they have taken, the VOK, is not heavily guarded. The alleged leaders of the coup are walking in and out of it as they please, going to town to loot and then coming back. Oh yes, they were looting shops. And what actually happened is that Sergeant Pancreas Akumu, at one point, came back to the VOK, came back to base, and was met with gunfire <laughs> as he tried to enter the VOK 
because the loyal troops had already taken it back. What? How can you convince anybody that this was a serious thing? Yes, people lost their lives, especially innocent people. Even soldiers lost their lives. But the whole plot was not a serious plot designed to take over a government. How? How can you convince me it was? So, we now have to answer the question, who was the main person behind this mind-boggling, sadistic plot? Yeah, where people would lose their lives for nothing. Now, in the trial of Sergeant Pancreas Akumo, a name was dropped. <laughs> oh yes, a very famous name was just introduced. Casually, Sergeant Akumu in his defense said he had heard that there was a politician, a man called Charles Mugane Njonjo, a former AG, and who was then a minister in Moy's cabinet. Sergeant Akumu said in his defense that this was the man who was planning a coup, and Sergeant Akumu had heard of it, and therefore Sergeant Akumu acted to abort, yeah, frustrate that planned coup. His idea was to cause confusion in the Air Force so that when Buona Jojo came with the real coup, he would have no proper Air Force to work with. And therefore, Sergeant Akumu was suggesting that he should be treated as a hero who saved Kenya rather than somebody charged with treason. The prosecution laughed off this defense and warned the sergeant to stop spoiling the name of a respected Kenyan politician, dragging them in the mud when there was absolutely zero evidence of their involvement in a so-called planned coup. Now for years, many Kenyans believed that it was Njonjo who was behind the coup the real power behind that attempted coup. Charles Mugane Njonjo himself yeah, has strongly denied the claim. Despite the fact that shortly after that coup attempt, there was a commission of inquiry yeah, whose main subject was Charles Mugane Njonjo. And that commission of inquiry presented a lot of evidence that they claimed suggested that Jojo had committed treason, was actually working against the very government he was bang in the middle of. In fact, he was a very powerful member of that very government. Yeah, the Commission of Inquiry accused him of trying to overthrow, trying to frustrate. And the Commission of Inquiry presented this evidence before President Daniel Toriti Chalapmoy, who forgave Jojo. Yeah. He just let him go and forgave him. But personally, I believe in Jojo. He was not involved. So who was? Now I'd like us to focus on a major player in all these manenos. A man called James Kanyoto, who was head of the country's intelligence at the time. Indeed, he had held that post. Since 1965, he took it over when he was barely 26 years old. Now, if you examine the career of that man, James Kanyoto, he was a man of big, game-changing intelligence operations, yeah, including one that I've covered in detail on this channel, the one that unfolded in 1969, and the objective of that operation was to secure the presidency of Jomo Kenyatta and to neutralize all threats present and even those that were building up to be threats in the future. That operation involved the assassination of a man called Aguin Skodek, who was then Minister for Foreign Affairs. Yeah, and his assassination was made to look like a road accident. It also involved the assassination of Tom Boyer, and the action-packed grand finale of that particular operation was the October 25th, 1969 Kisumo Massacre, 
which was designed to give the government an excuse to ban the opposition party then, the Kenya People's Union, and to put the very influential national politician, Jaramogi Oginga Odinga, out of action, yeah, put him under house arrest and out of politics. I trust that many other Kenyans will do a lot of research into this character, James Kanyoto. Because in my opinion, this is a man who had very little regard for precious human lives. He tended to focus on the big goal yeah, and never gave a second thought to the collateral damage yeah, that usually comes with such operations, which in my view, somebody should always make an effort to limit. There is no evidence I've seen that Bonacanyoto made any efforts to limit the loss of lives in his operations. Operations necessary for national security. Or so we have been made to believe, although that is very debatable, yeah, looking back in retrospect. Anyway, Kanyotu was the man in charge early in the Moi presidency. He actually retired in 1991. And it is not too difficult to find a possible motive for the actions of Bwana Kanyotu. You see, early in the Moi presidency, Moi was a good guy. And although very early on, he told us he would follow in the footsteps of his predecessor, Mze Jomo Kenyatta, yeah, at a fuata nyayo, the Hayati Mze Kenyatta, that's why he was called nyayo. Although he told us that very clearly, it was also very clear that Moi, aboard, hated some of the things that Jomo Kenyatta got involved with during his presidency. And he wanted, during his presidency, to get as far away as possible from being another Jomo Kenyatta, despite what he was telling Kenyans. And so there were no political detainees in the country. Zero for the first time since independence. Now, let us just face political reality. It is not possible, at least at that time, it was not possible to rule Kenya as a Mr. Nice Guy. We have very ambitious politicians, very ambitious Kenyans, full of mischief. The sad reality is that you need to be a tough guy, very tough, to survive as a president in Kenya. And at least in those days, one needed to be feared. Others, people would do what they wanted. And you'd find that the country is ungovernable within a very short time of a nice guy president. And by the way, a Mr. Nice Guy president gives the intelligence community in the country very little to do. At the very least, it takes that intelligence community away from exciting operations away from the operations which they have skill sets for and reduces them to mere paper pushers. Now we know that early on Moy was very paranoid of the Kikuyu community, the House of Mumbi community. Indeed, the one keyword yeah, that would get him all excited and alarmed was the word Wakikuyu. Wakikuyu amefanya hivi, wamefanya hivyo. That would always get his attention. And that is why I believe it was not a coincidence that the unit in the military that was chosen for this particular operation, if my theory is correct and this was an operation, was the Air Force. Because the person heading the Air Force at that time was, I'm sure you can guess it, was a Kikuyu. It was not a secret that the president felt very threatened by this community. Now, one way of catching a criminal, a guilty person, is to carefully examine what happens after the crime is committed. Because it will bring out the motive, the reason why the crime was committed in the first place. And more often than not, it will also lead you to the person who committed the crime. And indeed, we can see that after the 1982 coup, President Daniel Toretti Charapmoy changed completely into a very, very different president. 
after the attempted coup, our intelligence community started getting busy once again. Doing the same old, same old they had done during Jomo Kenyatta's presidency. And so if indeed it was an intelligence operation, it achieved its objectives 101%. 1,000% if you like, because Moi changed. Moi became the tough president who would rule Kenya with an iron fist for all those long years. For those long 20 years after August 1982. And if we can come back to what we know for sure, a lot of those things that happened in 1982 leading up to the coup would never have happened without the full cooperation of the intelligence community. No way. In my opinion going forward, one day in the future, we should have a full intensive inquiry into what really happened on August 1st, 1982 and bring to book those who are still alive who were involved in this operation that ended up hurting Kenyans so much. And I know one can argue that it secured the peace of Kenya for decades after that. One can argue, had it not been done like that, Kenya may have ended up in a real mess, maybe even in a real military coup. I'm very much aware of such an argument, but I don't agree. There are many ways of skinning a cat. There are many options one could have used to solve a problem that they saw was important for the country then. Now, in case you're looking for this kind of inside information, inside thorough analysis on Kenyan politics, I would highly recommend my weekly intelligence briefings. And for the next few days, ending on 5th August 2021, to commemorate and remember this dark side of Kenyan history, I will give a special offer an amazing and indeed exciting offer where you can get a live membership to my weekly intelligence briefings for, wait for this one, for the year where it all happened, for only 1982 Kenya shillings, you will be able to secure life membership to my weekly intelligence briefings. You have a very short time. Please go for it. $19.82 or 1982 Kenya shillings. Just listen in briefly for a few more details.